The Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Keeping the Faith with your host, Senior Fellow Joe Wolcott. Psalm 6 O Lord, deliver my life. To the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch um, with my weeping. My eyes wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Welcome back to Keeping the Faith. I am your host, Joseph Walcott, and I have a much lighter episode for you all today than the opening selection from the Psalms would suggest. So I'm just going to get right into it. This is a lighter topic than the last uh, few that I've been doing. I want to talk about the importance of the Psalms, both in their context in Scripture and especially I want to highlight why we should sing the Psalms in worship. So there are four main areas I want to cover with this. I want to talk about some of the practical benefits going into a study of the Psalms. I want to talk about how the Psalms are used in the Bible. I want to talk about how the Psalms have been used in historical worship. And I want to finally end with how they can and have been used in modern worship. So, again, let's just get right into it. Practical benefits. I think an excellent statement of the profoundity of the Psalms can be found in the introduction to John Calvin's commentary on the Psalms. Uh, Calvin writes this, The Holy Spirit has here drawn to the life of, all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities. In short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. The other parts of scripture contain the commandments which God enjoined his servants to announce to us. But here, the prophets themselves, seeing they are exhibited to us as speaking to God and laying open all their inmost thoughts and affections, call, or rather draw, each of us to the examination of himself in particular, in order that none of the many infirmities to which we are subject and of the many vices with which we, are, we abound may remain concealed. It is certainly a rare and singular advantage when all lurking places are discovered and the heart is brought into the light, purged from that most baneful infection, hypocrisy. What Calvin is getting at here is that the Psalms are, if nothing else, a very relatable book of the Bible. These, like he said, are songs in which the psalmists working under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are pouring out their hearts and souls for us to read. And really, if we consider the whole body of the Psalms, they put on display the entirety of the human condition. I think of pretty much any, any state of emotion that you could be in, any sort of experience that you need a, a calming word from the Lord on. There's, there's a psalm for that. Uh, there, there are 150 of these things, and it's just so, so rich in what it reveals about humanity. Um, so that's, that's one thing, that, that it, it profoundly exposes to us what it means to be human. Um, second point on this, 
I've read some people that have argued that the Psalms are a sort of pre-incarnational revelation of Christ. Because if we think about it, so Christ was truly God, truly man. He comes, he fulfills a lot of what's in the Psalms. In, in, in a very real sense, he becomes the content of the Psalms there. Um, we also see that the content works its way into Christ's role as mediator. So for example, if you read Hebrews, one of the things that prominently comes up in the book of Hebrews is Christ in his priestly role, in his role as the mediator between us and God. And so part of that is like having that sort of intercessory prayer there. Uh, the scholars I've read point out that um, you see both his humanity and his divinity in this, that in his humanity, he would have prayed much of these sorts of things. Think, for example, of when he was in distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, like, it's not unprecedented for the idea of Jesus praying uh, inspired words, something like this. Whereas in his divinity, again, that gets to the mediator role. So again, that's how we can see elements of Christ in the Psalms, that essentially Christ came and fulfilled the Psalms there, that he was a consummation of it, much like other bits of the Bible. Getting into the Bible itself, the Psalms are especially important in the New Testament. Uh, in the Greek New Testament, there are roughly 400 quotations from the Psalms. And I really want to break it down into three sections here. I want to look at the use of the Psalms in the Gospels. I want to look at their use by Paul. And I want to briefly look at how they're used in the book of Hebrews. So let's get right into it. So in the Gospels, we see that the Psalms are used frequently by Christ and by the Gospel writers to reveal Christ's identity to us. Sometimes they are small quotes that pull a little bit from the original language and would have required the original audience to make the connection there. So for example, I'm going to read here parallels between Luke 13:27 and Psalm 6 verse 8. Um, and then for Luke, you can also see similar language used in Matthew 7:23. So Luke 13:27 says, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Psalm 6, 8, which I just read not that long ago. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. So we see, again, smaller reference. The depart from me, you workers of evil is the key text in there. But we also have explicit reference to the Psalms by Christ. So, for example, look at the parallel accounts in Mark 12, 9 through 11, Matthew 21, 42, and Luke 20, 17. I'm going to focus and read from Mark 12 for the sake of this and see how that parallels with Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. So, Mark 12. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Skipping to Psalm 118, it says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So we see right there, just straight up Jesus quoting the psalm. And again, his original audience would have been aware of this. Uh, you also see the use of the psalms in how the people responded to Christ. So for example, look at the triumphal entry in Matthew 21 verse 9. It says this, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That parallels with Psalm 118, verse 26, where it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So we see there, again, the gospel writers use the Psalms to show Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We see further um, 
Christ's weeping for Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 39. It says, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, going back to Psalm 118, 26. Remember, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So again, same, same verse we just looked at there, but it's pulling a smaller phrase like I talked about earlier. So we see in the Gospels, there's this huge reliance on the Psalms as testimony to the identity of Christ. That brings us to Paul. Uh, Paul uses the Psalms as revealing the gospel as ancient, that the gospel isn't purely a New Testament invention. And he talks about it as predicting the events of the first century AD with the foundation of the church. Uh, So, for example, uh, apologies, I forgot to insert the actual text into my show notes here, but Romans 10, 18 says this. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Uh, Important note here, uh, you can't see what's going on in my Bible here, but when it starts with their voice has gone, that enters a quote format, at least in my Bible. And what he's doing here is he's quoting Psalm 19, verse 4. He says, Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. So this is him showing, Paul showing, using the Psalms, the spread of the gospel. Skipping to a separate topic, he also uses the Psalms to show the prediction of the power of sin over Jews and Gentiles. So that requires us to look at Romans 3, verse 18, where he says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, That is in the middle of a longer quote that runs from verse 10 through 18. But again, parallel that with Psalm 36, verse 1. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Some parallel language there. And then a third point that Paul uses the Psalms for is he uses it to show the rejection of the gospel by the Jews. So for that, we need to skip to Romans 11, verses 9 and 10. Again, this is a quote that Paul is putting into his text. It says, And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So we have that in Romans and then parallel that with Psalm 69 verses 22 and 23. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and make their loins tremble continually. So again, we see larger theme in Paul, paralleling that that statement in the Psalms with the reality that comes to pass in the New Testament days. Skipping to the book of Hebrews, I can't possibly exhaustively cover this because Hebrews has 37 different citations of the Psalms, uh, of which 11 particular Psalms are quoted. But I, one of the things that I saw is that the Psalms are used here as term associations, kind of similar to the shorter phrases that Jesus uses in the gospel. So take a look, for example, at Hebrews 1, 5 through 7. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And then there are two different psalms. Uh, that are being dominantly cited there. So Psalm 2 verse 7 says, I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So we see 
the author of Hebrews referencing that there. And then Psalm 104, verse 4 says, He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. So we see that. And then for a longer bit that you can read into on your own, because it's just a lot of text to get into, you see that the author of Hebrews uses Psalm 110 as the basis for his argument that Christ is a great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 7. But above all, uh, in talking about the scripture, the main point that should stick with us is found in Luke 24, verse 44. So for a little bit of context here, this is in Luke's account, after Christ has been risen, Christ has appeared to his disciples as they're gathered, and he is finally explaining to them the fulfilled gospel, uh, in, consummated in his death and resurrection. And Luke 24 says this, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So we see there, Christ just comes out and says it, that he is the fulfillment of the law, the prophets, which basically means, like, that, that's usually used as shorthand for the whole Old Testament law and prophets. And then he specifically mentions the Psalms. So clearly, the Psalms are very important. I want to transition now to talking about how historically the Psalms have been used in worship. So we'll start with a tiny bit about Jewish worship, and then we'll move on to Christian use of the Psalms in worship. Very, very basic bits about the temple worship. We don't know a lot about the liturgy that went on in the temple, especially during the days of the first temple. Um, but what we do see in some of the Psalms are a few context clues. So for example, the heading of Psalm 92 says a Psalm, a song for the Sabbath. So it's interesting because you see Psalms being assigned to days of the week. And you see that trend continue during the time of the Septuagint. Um, there was a set list of Psalms where there's a different Psalm associated with each day of the week. <clears throat> Excuse me during the time of the Septuagint there. So that's some of the early developments we see around it. You move on to the synagogue, and you see that they had something of a liturgical calendar. They had psalms associated with different holidays and feast days. So for example, there's a long stretch of Jewish holidays that kind of are around, like slightly before and then after Passover, where each feasts, they will work through psalms, if I'm remembering correctly, it's 113 through 118 in their worship. And there are a bunch of other holidays I found that I'd never heard of uh, in any great detail before finding out the psalms were assigned to them. So that's what I have to say about Jewish worship. Let's move on to the early church, to Christian worship and writings. So if you look at older liturgies from both Eastern and Western Christianity, you see that the Psalms are everywhere in it. Um, it's kind of throw a stone. See, you'll, you'll hit at least one Psalm uh, if you throw a stone into that, those liturgies, metaphorically speaking. We also see that the church fathers in their writings heavily cited uh, from the Psalms. Uh, three big examples. Uh, Justin Martyr pulled from the Psalms in some of his dialogues that he had in his letter to Trypho, which is the famous um, ancient church apologetics letter from Justin Martyr representing Christianity to Trypho the Jew. Uh, you see Irenaeus, he pulls heavily from the Psalms in Against Heresies and a few of his other works. And Augustine, pulls from the Psalms when recounting the story of his life, particularly when he gets to the account of his conversion and baptism. So we see that's some stuff that kind of stays consistent throughout the early church, 
some of those Eastern and Western liturgies, they continued throughout the medieval period, where we really get to some fun stuff, and stuff that I personally really, really care about in the history is when we get to the Reformation. So Martin Luther, for example, he really loved the Psalms. Like that was, that was his bread and butter. Luther was obsessed uh, in the best way possible. And some of his songs reflect that. He has songs that are paraphrases of the Psalms. For example, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Probably the song you think of when you think of Martin Luther. That is a paraphrase of Psalm 46. Um, yeah, so when you think about music in the Reformation, though, it's, it's hard to talk about the Psalms without talking about the Reformed tradition uh, because you have, and, and right, rightly so, um, a lot of people tend to remember the old Lutheran original compositions, and they are quite great compositions. What I think really tends to fly under the radar is that the Reformed very early on developed a very strong tradition of psalm singing, often a cappella psalm singing, kind of what you'd see from the exclusive psalmody, like very hardcore proponents of the regulative principle of worship today. I can, I'll probably talk about that at a different time on how exactly the regulative principle works. But we see, you know, it starts with John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where he ministered. He wanted to put the Psalms into meter so that congregational singing would be increased. Uh, we see that he wanted really two main things with the Psalms. He wanted to put it into the common vernacular of the people, and he wanted congregational participation. Two of the early writers that Calvin drafted to help with setting the Psalms to meter were Clement Marot and Louis Bourgeois, and they composed many classic tunes. The one that the one that you all are probably most familiar with is what's referred to as Old Hundredth. That was written by Bourgeois, and it, if I'm remembering correctly, it was originally used for Psalm 134, but it's called the Old Hundredth because when it came around that the Genevan Psalter uh, was translated into English, a man named William Keth set the tune for 134 to 100 in the English. Some of you may know that setting by the hymn, hymn number one in the Trinity hymnal that we have up in the GCC chapel. It's all people that on earth do dwell. Uh, that tune is also quite popular to use for many doxologies that are out there. So that's one tune that emerged from the Reformed psalm singing tradition. For a few other key documents here, um, 1551, you have the Geneva Psalter is completed under Theodore Beza, uh, an associate of Calvin in Geneva. In 1564, the Genevan Psalter was adopted and adapted by the church in Scotland, and that became a part of the Book of Common Order, uh, which was used by the early Presbyterian church. 1650, you get a man named Francis Rouse, who crafts a new Psalter uh, for the Scots. And then as another note, in England, 1549, the original Anglican prayer book had things set up so that they would go through the Psalms in its entirety every month. Um, any of you who are listening that are practicing Anglicans, uh, Leave a comment down below, because I'm, I'm interested to know whether modern renditions of the Book of Common Prayer still do that. It would be really great if it did. I just don't know. Uh, so please, by all means, educate me down in the comments there. But I want to I give you, before moving on to the Psalms for today, I want to give you a few excellent examples of modern Psalters, collections of the Psalms set to meter, that you can use in your life or in your worship. So I'm gonna rattle off, I have 
six different Psalters here I want to briefly discuss. So the first one I want to talk about is the Book of Praise. The most recent edition came out in 2014. This is a publication of the Canadian Reformed Churches. Excuse me. Um, the Canadian Reformed Churches have a quite wonderful tradition of using the Book of Praise uh, in their worship. The Book of Praise is probably one of the best preservations of the Genevan Psalter on this hemisphere. Um, yeah, it, it has the Psalms in English all set to the original 150 tunes used in the Genevan Psalter. Plus, it includes gems like the ecumenical creeds and the three forms of unity, all of which are fantastic add-ons. But of particular note, it's the Book of Psalms set to the original Jeevan, didn't even meter. So that's one well worth checking out. Um, I mentioned the exclusive psalmody position here. You have the RPCNA, the Reformed Presbyterian Church in North America. That is a denomination of Presbyterianism which draws its lineage directly from the Scottish Covenanters. And one of their big things is that they believe in only singing the Psalms in worship and only a cappella. And I have my disagreements with that position. However, it's undeniable that they have mastered that form of art. In 1973, they published the Book of Psalms for Singing. It's a nice little red book. It's got some of that older language. So if you're really attached to the these and the thousand having like this, yeah, just a really old time-worn feeling to singing the Psalms. Book of Psalms for Singing is an excellent one. They came out in 2009 with an updated version, the Book of Psalms for worship, and that is set in modern English, a few adjustments to the tunes and whatnot, both of which I would highly recommend. And I would highly recommend checking out an RPCNA church because even though they don't have instruments and they only sing the Psalms a cappella, um, they are really good, at least in my experience, of making sure their congregations are instructed in the singing of four parts. And that that really comes together quite well. If nothing else, you can find on Spotify, if you follow Crown and Covenant publications, that is the big publishing house of the RPCNA. They have selections of the Book of Psalms for worship that they have put out audio productions of. So that's an excellent one. The Psalms of David in Meter is the next one. You can find that on Amazon. It's like $10 for it. And that is a nice little pocket-sized printing of the 1650 Psalter. Uh, that was used in Scotland by the Puritans. So I'll spend less time on that one. But just throwing it out there, that's a nice cheap Psalter, but it's, it's still a really nice one. Uh, Psalms for All Seasons came out in 2011. This was meant to be a cross-traditional one. And I haven't looked too deeply into it yet, but I've had it recommended to me by several people. And it seems like a pretty solid one. It's very thick, about a thousand pages or so, but it's it's very comprehensive in the tunes that it uses in setting the songs. But I want to move on to my personal favorite from this list, and that is the Trinity Psalter hymnal. That came out in 2018. It's a joint publication of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC, and the United Reformed Church in North America, the URCNA. And this one, this really, um, th this really hits with me because the church I'm from back home uses the Trinity hymnal. Uh, Again, same hymnal that we have up in the chapel here at Grove City. Um, what the Trinity Psalter hymnal does is it pulls in that reformed history of singing the psalms. It sets all 150 of the psalms to meter in, in the hymnal, uh, usually to familiar tunes from the Trinity hymnal. It's, it seems to be assuming familiarity with its core audience with the Trinity hymnal. Um, but it also includes hymns in it from all throughout church history. Like you 
when you look at how old some of these are, um, we use the Trinity Psalter over where I go to church here. Um, and one of the things that they're doing right now is for Sunday school, Dr. Graham spends five minutes in church history before the Sunday schools, and he talks about a different psalm, not psalm, a, a different hymn in that hymnal in history. Uh, and it really, it really helps you appreciate being part of that cloud of witnesses described in Hebrews 12. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a quite excellent one. It has all of the Psalms and it has many classic hymns and some really underrated hymns that you might not know. So that's been a long winded bit of, with me about modern Psalters and the history of using the Psalms. I want to briefly transition to and talk about why we should prioritize using the Psalms in modern worship. So for one thing, there are studies that indicate that singing and music helps with memory. Uh, I can testify to this anecdotally. My school where I went to from fourth through 12th grade, um, in the grammar school, so like in the fourth through sixth grade, they would have us learn little songs and mnemonics to, to, to help remember things. And there are many of those that I still remember today. Um, <laughs> like just little, little funny things that you wouldn't expect, like remembering a bunch of the details of the story of the Alamo set to the tune of Jingle Bells. Uh, like Stuff like that, stuff that you think is kind of dumb when you're a kid, but that's like, oh, I remember all this stuff all these years later. Um, and I would propose that we should take that philosophy even more so with the Psalms. Psalm 119.11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We see that, yeah, singing helps with memory and what better thing to memorize than God's inspired revelation about human nature, about the human condition, that memorizing these words to sing to each other and to sing back to God. There's, there's a real beauty, and nothing quite matches up to it, of singing God's word to each other and knowing that he is hearing it. We also know that the Psalms are uniquely designed to be sung. You see, many of the Psalms are addressed to the choir master, or it specifies different instruments that you're supposed to use. There are other songs and prayers and whatnot in this book that we can set to meter for singing, but the Psalms are explicitly laid out that we should be singing these, that this is meant for the gathered assembly of believers to be worshiping with. So we have that element of it. And again, of all the stuff I talked about here, I want you to consider the significance of the Psalms, that like the way that they reveal Christ, the way Christ declared that they revealed him, the way we see it progress throughout the entire New Testament. So we see that the Psalms have great significance. We see that the Psalms help us to memorize these words of great significance and to store it up in our hearts. We see that the Psalms cover the full range of human emotion and experience that uninspired, and in this case, I merely mean not given to us by God himself, that uninspired music can't compete with. Like, the, these songs are 150 songs that have been given to us straight from God. I mean, we should at least, at, at, at bare minimum, use them in worship because they are a gift from God. I want to end with a little caveat slash um, contextualization here. So I am not pro-exclusive psalmody like some in the Reformed tradition are. I respect the position. And they do a good job with what they have. But uh, I hold that we should sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in worship according to Ephesians 5. I just want to offer a little word of clarity on what it means when it says spiritual songs. Uh, this is 
pulled straight from one of the sources I found when I was researching this for my own curiosity not too long ago. Uh, regarding spiritual songs, spiritual song from the Greek word hodes, hodais, which means song, and the antecedent pneumatikos, spirit, is a category of songs which are of or in the realm of the spirit. Since God and his word are spirit, spiritual songs are therefore God's word. So in other words, Ephesians 5 means this for our worship. Sing the Psalms. Sing rich and meaningful compositions and speak and sing the scriptures to each other. We need to start creating new good music as the church, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that good music is appropriate for worship. That, that again, gets into the regulative principle, which I think, I think, and I th don't consider this set in stone, but I think I'll do an episode on the regulative principle in the future. Um, but most importantly, the Psalms, the divinely inspired songs that God has given to us that are filled with rich meaning throughout the entirety of the biblical text is one of the three types of music. In fact, it is the first, it is the primary music that we are told to use in Ephesians 5. And so my hope for you who are listening is to, to really have gained from this episode a greater appreciation of the book of Psalms and to have a, a desire to at least explore the, the true joy and fulfillment that can be found in taking these inspired words directly from the book, not necessarily a paraphrase, though there are some beautiful paraphrases out there. Again, see Martin Luther and whatnot but taking the words that God has given us and singing it as, as he intended with human creativity applied to it. I think there's joy and beauty in that that is really unsurpassed by, uh, I'll be bold and say it, basically any other music that humans have ever created. So that's all I have for you guys for today. Uh, allow me to close us with this episode selection from the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 6. Question 16. Why must he be a true and righteous man? Answer. He must be a true man because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should pay for sin. He must be a righteous man because one who himself is a sinner cannot pay for others. Question 17. Why must he at the same time be true God? Answer. He must be true God so that by the power of his divine nature, he might bear in his human nature the burden of God's wrath and might obtain for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Question 18. But who is that mediator who at the same time is true God and a true and righteous man? Answer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is freely given unto us for complete redemption and righteousness. Question 19. From where do you know this? Answer. From the Holy Gospel, which God himself first revealed in paradise. Later, he had it proclaimed by the patriarchs and prophets, and foreshadowed by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he had it fulfilled through his only Son. Thank you for listening. This has been Keeping the Faith. I am your host, Joseph Wolcott. I'll see you in the next episode.